All right. Well, I'm here today with Pastor Matthew Everhard, and we've sort of become, uh, I'd say, internet friends, so to speak. And um, so I've enjoyed his content, and um, I kind of wanted to talk to him about his recent change from uh, what we might call a critical text position to a majority text position. Uh, before we do, I'd like uh, Pastor Everhard to introduce himself and kind of tell us a little bit about himself and what he's up to. Well, hey, Stephen, thanks for having me on your channel. Uh, my name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship, PCA. So we are a Reformed Bible-believing church here in Western Pennsylvania, about a little over half an hour just north of Pittsburgh. I've been the pastor here for three plus years before that in Florida, before that, uh, born and raised in Ohio. Also, I'm an adjunct professor at RPTS, the Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh, and uh, I write in terms of Jonathan Edwards studies. So textual criticism is technically not my field, but it's one that I have a strong interest in, actually more of a Jonathan Edwards scholar. But uh, thanks for having me on. Glad to be here. Yeah, uh, glad to have you on. And you have just recently come out with a new book, which I hope people can kind of see behind me. Uh, souls. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that before we get into some of the uh, textual stuff? Sure. So the subtitle is called How Jesus Saves Sinners, and I've just been wanting to write a book about the gospel for a long time. On my YouTube channel, I get questions all the time about how the gospel actually works. And sometimes these questions surprise me because I assume that they are fundamental building blocks of understanding that most Christians should have some apprehension of already. And yet, when I get questions about basic things, I uh, I want to be able to explain the gospel as clearly as I possibly can. In fact, one time I was training a group of missionaries, 20-somethings mostly, young young people. They're about to go on to the mission field, several months worth of, uh, of service around the world. And it was my job to teach a lecture called Sin and the Cross. It was going to teach over five days, 15 hours of content. And what I thought was very basic components of the gospel, the fact that we're sinners and that we need to be saved by Christ's blood on the cross, came across as new material to this group of missionaries. And I was stunned. Some of them loved what I was teaching. Others recoiled in horror as I talked about sin and death and, and, and even hell and the necessity of faith in Christ to be saved. And that's when it struck me, man, I just have to do a book about the gospel itself. So the title of the book, How Jesus Saves Sinners, basically takes us from creation to the fall of man, to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and how his perfect work on the cross avails for us to grant us atonement, forgiveness, justification, begins the sanctification process in our lives, and then the news is so good that we have to go out and share it with the world. So it's a it's 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 essentially a tract. It's a Bible tract, but in, in long form, two hundred pages, just going through all the basic components of the gospel. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. That's cool. So, would you say that this is uh, primarily um, going going to be useful to people who are in your own tradition? I I received the book yesterday, so I haven't had time to read it yet. But mm -hmm. do you think? Um, the broader Christian tradition, uh, tradition will feel comfortable with this book. This is something you put in the hands of a Baptist or, you know, some other denomination. What do, what do you think? Well, I hope so because what I'm simply describing is the good news of the gospel. Uh, most of which we're going to be able to completely agree on. Now, I will say that I'm a Presbyterian and I don't hide it. So occasionally I will quote from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, I restrained myself in quoting Jonathan Edwards. I think I only quoted him once or twice throughout the book. There are occasional references to the thought of a Calvin or a Spurgeon. So you may get the, the flavor that I am a Reformed Christian, which I obviously am. But then again, um, look, uh, the cross is something that we should largely agree on. How the blood of Jesus atones for our sins should not be a major area of controversy between Christians. I know it can be. A lot of it's due to ignorance, though. And I would say simply this. If you can't define the difference between justification on one hand and sanctification on the other hand, then you might be the kind of person that really needs this book, because those are two very key concepts that as we read through the New Testament, 
there's going to be some assumption that you know what Paul's talking about when he talks about justification by faith or uh, the, the Lord's work and sanctification in our lives. So there's some really key context, concepts that I try to explain in everyday terms, like I'm talking to you on the street, um, so that Christians can be really grounded in in the knowledge and understanding of the gospel itself. Yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. So, yeah, it is Souls, How Jesus Saves Sinners, and I will leave a link in the description, so make sure you get a copy of this. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, so you have recently changed your position a little bit, maybe, and uh, you had made a video. Um, there's one kind of, uh, I liked your thumbnail on it. You had uh, from Street Fighter, I think, two two guys that were fighting the Texas Receptus of the critical uh, text on one side, and you ended up landing with the critical text. And I remember watching that video and... It seems to me, I, I even put a comment on at the time. Uh, you sort of at that time, I think you you were painting with a little broader br brush, and that's fine. It's a you know a video geared to a popular audience, and so Byzantine and and Texas Receptus was sort of kind of lumped together in one broad str uh, stroke, as I recall. Uh, but then later, you did some more reading um, and those of us that were following you, you sort of made a transition, right? So you went from a critical text guy to, I think you call yourself a majority text guy. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, when we say that I changed my position on scripture, just to clarify, I did not change my position in such a way that my view of scripture's authority is diminished in any way. So what we confess is that God's word is inspired by God, that it is inerrant, which means that it contains no errors, and that it is infallible, which means that everything it says is entirely trustworthy. So in that sense, my position has not changed even one iota. I'm the kind of person that has a very high view of the Holy Scriptures. In fact, in my church, whenever we read the Bible, we have people stand up and we recognize that God's word read to us from the scriptures is the same. It has the same authority as if God blew the roof off the church and spoke to us audibly like he did to, uh, to Moses and to Israel on Mount Sinai. So I'm not saying that my, my theology of God's word has diminished or changed one iota. Very high view. What we're talking about here is a discussion related to the text of the Greek New Testament. And this is something that I have had to wrangle with quite a bit over the last couple of years. I've been thinking about this. I'd say it's about two years now. Um, I'm a person who is not an expert in the Greek, although I do read the Greek uh, every day. In fact, I'm either reading from the Greek New Testament or the Greek Septuagint Old Testament for my devotions in the morning. So, so the text is an important thing to me. I want to know which text I should pick up. And there are a couple of different options. If you're a New Testament reader, you've mentioned the critical text on one hand, we might think of the UBS 4 or the UBS 5 or the Nestle Allen 28. On the other hand, there's the Textus Receptus, which is the printed Greek New Testament of the Reformation era. I own both of them. There's also the Tyndale House Greek New Testament, and there's the Robinson Pierpont majority text or Byzantine text form. And I love them all. I got to be honest with you. But at the end of the day, I'm thinking through these issues and I had begun by assuming a critical text position, and that was simply because in all of my theological training at every level, a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and doctoral degree, it was assumed that the critical text was the most academic and scholarly Greek text that there is. And in one sense, that's right. On the other hand, though, I was challenged on a couple of my positions by some other brothers that hold to a Textus Receptus position, and their challenges to me really made me think about this. I thought to myself, well, my goodness, there is something powerful about the Reformation, obviously, and the fact that the Textus Receptus was the Greek New Testament in the Reformation era and that's what the Reformers used, and that's what the Westminster Divines used, and we subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Maybe I should really think about the Textus Receptus. Ironically, in all of that study, I ended up coming to what I call a, a moderating position or immediate position between the two, which is the majority text position. So that's kind of some of the soul searching that I've been doing on my own in the past couple of years.
Yeah, that's interesting. So as far as you're concerned, what do you think? And you did a whole video on this and I'll leave a link, uh, but just kind of for the sake of my audience um, and some who probably haven't watched your channel, who watch this channel, uh, can you tick off maybe one, two, three reasons why, you know, you have a whole list. I think it was 25 on that video, which is a great video, but maybe your top one, two, three reasons that, uh, that kind of nudged you that direction. Well, for me, what I really had to struggle with was between two virtues when it comes to um, doing text criticism. And the two virtues are antiquity on one hand versus multiplicity on the other hand, or majority readings on the other hand. So, so basically, sometimes the problem, and I'm going to be really, really simplistic here, is simply this. Some of the oldest manuscripts that we have do not always agree with the majority of the manuscripts that we have. And herein lies the conundrum that I had to wrestle with for, for quite a long time. In those rare and somewhat insignificant places that the New Testament manuscripts differ, there are some places in which you cannot have your cake and eat it too. If you hold to the that the oldest manuscripts are going to be the most reliable, then you probably are headed towards a critical text position because in the critical text, the UBS or the NA, they are largely depending on some of the oldest manuscripts that we have uh, available to our knowledge today. But those oldest ones don't always agree with the, the, the majority of the manuscripts that we have. And we have over 5,000 fragments or pieces of various uh, manuscripts, different links, different books, et cetera. Um, so you really are weighing these two options and the majority text position then being forced to, to choose <laughs> between those at times ends up saying it's probably a safer way to assume that God preserved the inspired text through the multiplicity of the text rather than some of these very rare, but yet, but yet very old ancient texts whose readings did not find their way into the, the mainstream majority position of the most of the manuscripts that we have available to our knowledge today. So that being said, the conclusion of a majority text position is that God does preserve his sovereign word, but he does so through the agreement of the majority of the manuscripts um, as they have been copied and copied by hand and used by the church over the centuries. There are a bunch of other reasons that I um, that I think represent my position well, um, including ubiquity. They come from a very large geographic area. The principle of Occam's razor, simply stating that there must be some simple conclusion to this otherwise very complicated problem. And uh, a number of other factors, I list about 25 of them in the video, that I think the majority text is a safe position, a moderating position between the two, in which it's hard to say you could really go wrong. Yeah, yeah. I think what, for me, what what bothered me was that when I looked at some of these variants, the manuscript support for some of some fairly large um differences you know this is all relative right we're not talking about you're going to become a, you're going to change your denomination because of a textual variant it's that that's not what we're talking about but when you're doing exegesis right when you're really studying the text closely it matters to you if if Jesus is is called the only begotten son or he's called the only begotten god right for mm -hmm. or, or sorry John 118 yeah. but when you look at how many manuscripts support the the critical text reading there it's vanishingly small. We're talking about like 97% of our manuscripts. And it's like, do I really feel comfortable throwing away? I'm not talking about, you know, 50% of my manuscripts, 60%. I'm talking about when I'm reaching levels of 98% agreement among the Greek witnesses. And then we want to talk about the wealth of of witnesses. You know, people want to talk about the embarrassment of riches because of all the Greek manuscripts we have and when we can throw out readings based on one or two manuscripts, um, that was troubling to me because if if 97% of my manuscripts could be wrong, what was to say that 100% of my manuscripts wouldn't also 
be wrong. So that was kind of a factor for me. And I liked you did a, an interview. I think it was with Dwayne Green. And I liked what you called the Byzantine text. You called it the rudder, I think is what the word you use. Maybe um, or maybe that was a different interview. But um, anyways, it, there, there's something about the stability over the centuries and that we know that this has been used by the people of God for a long period of time. Were, was any of that a factor in your, your thinking? Yes, of course, because we want to have essentially the same Bible that Christians have have always believed. Um, I think that is one thing that's slightly troubling to me, honestly, about the critical text and the Textus Receptus, in that in both of those cases, you have some readings that are they're very small minority readings. Um, for instance, in the critical text, um, whether it was he was manifested or God was manifested, that's theologically not that big of a deal because the antecedent to he is God in the previous section. Um, but like, I kind of want to know what what the word was. <laughs> and right. So, you know, if you have a very few manuscripts that have he and the vast majority of them says God, then it seems to be most reasonable to stay in the safe zone, which is the majority of the manuscripts have it right, that it's God was manifested in the flesh. In the flesh, And there's so many other passages like that. Um, most of them, though, are not theologically significant. For instance, whether or not it was the angel that stirred the waters in, in John 5, or whether it was just the sovereignty of God, you know, so most of these readings don't have theological bearing on our confessions. It's not like it's the difference between I'm going to be a Presbyterian or a Methodist because of Greek variants. But nevertheless, uh, and as much as possible, we want to know what the, the, the autograph said. And at the same time, here's the interesting thing, is that the Textus Receptus position, which was initially attractive to me because the Textus Receptus, Recepti, Textus Receptus is largely a majority text, it retains some minority readings, which kind of blow my mind. And John's comma in 1 John 5, 7 would be the most notable among those. So minority, in fact, that we can't even find a Greek manuscript until about almost uh, contemporaneous with Erasmus in the days of the printing press. Some of the only Greek manuscripts we have that. So why, why does that very rare minority reading make it into the Textus Receptus? when Textus Receptus advocates uh, cry out to us over and over again that minority readings, like in the Alexandrian text, shouldn't take precedence over the majority readings. So I think that a majority text position is actually the most consistent. Um, it's the most consistent methodology to do it. It's still very technical. It's still very scholarly and academic because we still have to work through all of the manuscripts to determine what the majority reading is. But it's a very simple principle that says God preserves his word through the vast agreement of the extant manuscripts that we have. And I think it's a very reasonable one. It also has very strong apologetic value too when it comes to defending our New Testaments, our inspired and inerrant New Testament against cultists or secularists or those of other religions who assail us for holding to the inspired text of the, of the New Testament. And yet one of the greatest apologetic defenses we have is, look, the New Testament is the best attested of any ancient book, better than the Iliad, better than the Odyssey, better than anything else that Marcus Aurelius ever wrote in terms of numerical preponderance. So it seems like there's strength in that uniformity and agreement between the texts. And I, I find that strength compelling. Yeah, no, that's good. I I was on our, uh, on the phone with our, our mutual friend, Dwayne Green, here uh, a couple days ago, and um, I told him a line I've wanted to use for a while. It's everybody is a majority text person. Every single person is a majority text person. Critical text guy is there ninety six percent of the time. He's a majority right. text guy. Yes, um, and a textus receptus person is there ninety eight point five percent of the time. The only people who are there a hundred percent of the time. Our majority text guys. <laughs> That's right. So, so so join us. It's good over here. <laughs> I would yeah. say this too. Here's another reason why I think the majority text is is an excellent and and safe position to be in, because we truly do value every single piece of, of New Testament data 
that we can get our hands on. And this is not always so. If you listen to some of the camps, uh, listen to them carefully, read between the lines of what they're saying. Sometimes they will demonize certain other texts because they come from this place or that place, because they're from Alexandria, because they're from Egypt, whatever. And there is attempt to diminish and to set aside some of these texts, uh, the four the four big ones that the critical text guys, they love these ones. But some of the Textus Receptus guys will demonize those texts as though they are demonic and corrupt and satanic or malevolent. They are manipulated, they're cultic, whatever they say. But a, a true majority text person says, no, every single piece of data that we have is an incredible treasure. And what we do is we value every single piece we have, whether it's a, whether it's a piece of liturgy, whether it's a quotation from an apostolic father, or whether we have these beautiful Byzantine um, minuscule manuscripts, or we find very ancient papyrus with the majuscule style writing. We love it all, and we want to collate all of it. And what we want to do is stay right in that mainstream, because essential to text criticism is the presupposition that the scribes can and do error. They are human, after all. The scribes that gave us the manuscripts of the New Testament, whether they're on vellum or papyrus, they made mistakes. Moreover, um, there was no dictionary to look up how to spell words. I think that's like most of the variants are spelling uh, differences and things like that, because there was no Oxford English dictionary to look things up. There was no Webster's 1800 whatever dictionary to look things up. They spelled as they knew how to spell. And so the variances are largely these very these very minor things that don't matter to the text uh, at all. But my point being, though, give me any piece of data, um, be it papyrus, vellum, whatever, Byzantine, Alexandrian. We want it. We want to know about it. And we want to collate that information so that we can stay right in that center lane of what Christians have always had and always believed over the centuries. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good. All that's really good. I think it's, it's one of the things that kind of surprised me is kind of the snobbery. Um, So um, I had, there's a scholar, he has his PhD in um, textual criticism and I, I won't reveal his name, um, and I reached out to him. Uh, actually, um, I have two two scholars that have agreed to come on, which are both Byzantine guys. Uh, one of them is going going to come on. The other one won't come on because he hasn't secured a academic position yet. And and I don't blame him because I mean his future is at stake. Like so, because he is a um, Byzantine priority guy, he's afraid to come out with that publicly. Um, because he might not be able to secure an academic position in the future. And so um, it was David Allen Black wrote the famous um, wrote the famous textbook on um, beginning Greek. And anyways, he's done some stuff on textual criticism as well. But he was on a, somebody else's show and he used this term and I just love it. It was actually on the on the differences between how you're going to understand the gospels. Are you going to say Mark's first or Matthew's first? Well, he went with the unpopular position from a scholarly perspective that, that Matthew's first. And he said, I finally had to decide that I was going to go against this evangelical group think. Mm -hmm. Right. And you and I, and by the way, this is a little disjunctive, what disjunctive, what I'm saying right now, I'm kind of a little all over the place right now, but, uh, Pastor Everhart and I had a chance before we began this video, and I was asking him some questions about his view on the book of Revelation. So if you want to see his book, his view on the book of Revelation the overview, uh, drop it down in the comment section. Let me know you want to see that. But we were talking about the kind of pressure that people get from their different traditions. And I was talking about certain pressures that I feel about, you know, different views that I might take and and things like that. Well, there is this sort of groupthink that people can get into. And in academia right now, if you take a Byzantine priority approach, you you can be pushed out, right, or not secure a position. And so people say, well, the vast majority of textual critics have this other view. Well, that's true, because if you hold this view, you don't get a chance to teach. You don't get you're you're not allowed in. So it's sort of like 
um, trying to say that a creationist, for example, is wrong because he doesn't get to teach at Harvard. Well, if you hold to a six day literal creation view, and I'm not arguing for that position right now, I'm just saying you can't say that it's wrong because that guy doesn't get to teach at this academic institution because the rules are set up such that they're not allowed in. So that kind of makes sense what I'm saying. It's sort I'm sort of all over the place right now with several ideas crashing into my little brain all at once. But mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you sort of understand what I'm trying to say. It's it's like the deck is stacked on an academic level for people who would want to hold a Byzantine priority approach. Well, here's a good example of that, of evangelical groupthink. I do think this is that's a, a powerful concept we need to be aware of. On one hand, um, we should be um, correctable by our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if I'm out on a limb and all of my brothers are say, telling me that limb is not safe, come back. I should consider that because I could definitely be wrong. On the other hand, there's a sense in which certain presuppositions go unchallenged, and we want to make sure that we explore all the options. One such example would be the longer longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. This is a highly debated, highly controversial topic, and one in which there is a great amount of very fruitful and helpful discussion to delve into. So I'm an advocate of footnotes in Bibles. I think Bibles should have footnotes and sometimes alert readers to anomalous information when it comes to the Greek manuscript. So most of the, the modern translations, ESV and ASB, those trans- kinds of translations will alert you to some anomalous endings to the Gospel of Mark, right? But um, one of the one of the false assumptions is that uh, the ending is so spurious that there's not a lot of support for it for the longer ending. I found that to be exactly the opposite. Whenever I got into that discussion, what I found out is no, there's only a few manuscripts that don't contain the larger ending. It's just that those manuscripts are very old, but the vast preponderance of the manuscripts in the majority text position do have Mark's longer ending. So I have no problem with putting a footnote in there or putting the text in brackets as the case may be. But that was one where kind of that group think of, ah, there's something spurious about that ending. I explored it myself as thoroughly as I could And I came to the position that, yes, Mark's longer ending has much to commend to it as being the authentic reading. And so I had to sort of challenge the critical text groupthink on that, that that text would be problematic. I came to the conclusion that that it wasn't. Yeah. And I think taking a a broader historical approach as well, like, okay, so, you know, we kind of got into this in our um, informal discussion on the book of Revelation. There's some views that are the majority view right now, right? And and they're current. And if you deviate from that, you know, it's a problem. But if you take a broader history, right? Look at the church much more broadly um, throughout the centuries. And you find out that some ideas that are very popular right now are actually pretty recent innovations. And so when I'm thinking about being corrected, I want to listen to voices from 500 years ago. I want to listen to voices, you know, even 1500 years ago. You know, I want to go back and look and see what have Christians historically believed about these things. And then when you look at like the the um, longer ending of Mark, well, maybe right now it's not a, a very popular position to actually think that that's authentic. That might not be on a on a when i say a popular position i'm talking about in academia right so if you hold that that's actually original to mark or should you know that might not be a popular position to hold in academia but if you look historically the church held to it for a very very long time and many times without contest i mean there's been some controversy about it early on but you understand what i'm saying I do. And this would be an area where I might pick on our Textus Receptus friends a little bit here, because as much as they stress how God used the Textus Receptus at the time of the Reformation and thereafter, um, constantly alerting us to the fact that this is the text in which 
uh, Luther and Calvin and the Westminster Divines and others of the great Puritans, uh, the, uh, especially Owen and Turretin, these guys used the Texas Receptus. Very true, very true. However, the question when it comes to textual criticism is not necessarily what have we had for the last 400 years, but rather what did we have in the first 400 years of Christianity? And then there's this neglected era of the middle too, because God's people uh, God has preserved not only his word, but he's preserved his people throughout that entire time, such that the people of God have never been denied access to the word of God itself. And so what we have to we have to look at is that the whole panoply of all of the data that's available, and I think the best position that is um, philosophically and, and theologically able to assess that is a majority text position. We want to be in the safe zone for what Christians have always had and have always believed. The best way to do that is to collate the text with a with a majority text position, in my view. I find certain strengths to the text, Textus Receptus view, which I apparently can't say in this video very well. I find other great strengths in the critical text view as well. But at the end of the day, the majority text is what, what seems most reasonable. Now, let me say a word in favor of the critical text. Um, one day I was doing my devotions and I had my UBS four, which is one of my favorite Greek New Testaments. And I was looking at a textual variant, a very small one, rather insignificant to the meaning of the passage. I looked down at the bottom in the footnotes. I love the footnotes because I'm kind of an academic at heart. And I saw all of this glorious data. You know, there was what the Latin Vulgate said, there was what the Syriac said, there was what the Byzantine tradition said, there's what Sinaiticus and Alexandrinus said. I had all of this in one place, and I actually got choked up and, and felt so thankful, the gratitude for the information that, that we have today that has been put together all in one place. What we have in even a, a critical text New Testament, even if you're a Textus Receptus guy, you should be very, very thankful to the point of, of gratitude and tears for all of the labor, all of the work of the scholars, the um, the theologians, the collators, even the scribes themselves who bequeath this information to us. I just can't find myself but being thankful for the information that we have today. I find it wonderful, and I'm thankful for all of it. Yeah, no, that's good. Well, uh, Pastor Everhard, you've been very, very generous with your time. I actually did not intend to take uh, this much of your time, but uh, I really appreciate it, and it's a joy to speak to uh, with you. And again, for those who uh, want to find out more about Pastor Everhard, I'll leave a link for his YouTube channel, and especially make sure you uh, check out his book, Souls, and uh, we'll be looking forward to catching up with you maybe some other time. Thank you so much, Stephen. You are doing the Lord's work on this channel. I appreciate your charitable spirits and your informed, learned discussions on these matters. I appreciate you having me on the channel, and we'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks.